Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we move on to the last session of day one that features hypertension management consensus today. I would like to invite onto the dais the moderator, uh, Professor N. N. Khanna, who, has, uh, who is a senior consultant interventional cardiologist and he is the coordinator for vascular services at the Indraprastha Apollo Hospitals in New Delhi where he also serves as a senior consultant in vascular interventions. Joining him as the chair would be Professor Sandeep Bansal, Drs. Raghuveer R. Kura, K. S. S. Bhatt, Tarun Dave, Sashi Bala, Amitesh Agarwal, A. Bhagwati, C. K. Ponde and Sonia Arora. I would also like to request uh, the President, uh, Dr. H. K. Chopra, to join the proceedings as well. We move ahead with the first presentation. Uh, all the speakers will feature for 11 minutes and we'll take up the last minute for a quick comment by the Chair. Our first lecture features on uh, epilrenin in hypertension. Where are we today? May I have the pleasure of inviting Professor Harsh Vardhan. He is the Director of Cardiology at the Primus Super Speciality Hospital at uh, New Delhi. A warm welcome to Professor Harsh Vardhan. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is the last session of the day. In a very important session of the day, I'll request uh, all the speakers, Harsh Vardhan, Harinder Kumar, if he's in the audience, kindly come on the dais. And the moderator for this session is none other than our own uh, Dr. N.N. Khanna. N.N. Khanna needs no introduction to the audience because he's the uh, upcoming elected CSI NIC chairman. For two years, he's going to be the NIC chairman and he has an extensive experience in the interventional cardiology. And the chairman for the session is very popularly known to us, Sandeep Bansal, who has a tremendous contribution both in intervention as well as clinical cardiology. I hand over the mic to Dr. N. N. Khanna to introduce our London speaker, Dr. Harshwardhan, and start the proceedings. Thank you, Dr. Chopra. Uh, Dr. Harshwardhan again needs no introduction. He is a giant uh, and a legend in cardiology in Delhi. And he's right now the director of uh, cardiology at Primus Institute, which is one of the very good institute in New Delhi. He's going to speak on a very important topic, uh, epilinerone in hypertension, where are we today? And this is something all of us really want to know, where are we today in terms of this drug? And I will ask, uh, request Dr. Harshwardhan to continue with his talk. Good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, I'd like to thank Dr. Chopra for having invited me to give this talk and to the chairpersons for the nice introduction. I am going to discuss today the role of epilinone in hypertension, where do we stand today. We know it is not a first-line drug in the treatment of hypertension. The first-line drugs being the ACE inhibitors, the ARBs, diuretics, calcium channel blockers, etc. The role of epilinone comes in the treatment of usually resistant hypertension when the first three line of drugs have failed to control the blood pressure. To understand it, let's understand how does this drug act. We know it acts by blocking the aldosterone, the mineral corticoids. Aldosterone is a potent mineral corticoid which plays a central role in the regulation of blood pressure. It increases sodium reabsorption by amyloride sensitive epithelial sodium channels on renal cortical collecting ducts and aldosterone indirectly regulates blood levels of electrolytes and helps to maintain the blood pH. We know besides having its effects on sodium retention and potassium excretion, it has effects on the heart, it increases cardiac fibrosis, increasing vascular inflammation, it increases vascular oxidative stress, reduces vascular nitric oxide, increases cardiac apoptosis, dysregulates fibrinosis, and increasing the sympathetic nervous system. So on the whole, the raised levels of aldosterone are not good for our heart, and the drug which blocks them is definitely going to help the cardiovascular system. Previously, we knew that the aldosterone receptors were in the kidney, but now we have recently discovered that they are also present in the brain, blood vessels, and the heart. And they have deleterious effects on the vascular inflammation and injury, prothrombotic state, potassium and magnesium loss, central hypertensive effects, endothelial dysfunction, vascular arrhythmias, sodium retention, and catecholamine potentiation, etc. So the action of aldosterone antagonists have been studied in various trials right across the continuous, continuum of cardiovascular disease. 
the real study was done in patients who had already suffered congestive heart failure. Then FSS study was done with aplerinone in patients who had myocardial infarction. And then we have few studies which are now being done in patients of hypertension to see what effect it has got on the control of blood pressure. In the treatment of drugs which block the mineralocorticoids, we have a phenomena called aldosterone breakthrough, which is particularly relevant when we are using drugs like ACE inhibitors and ARBs in treating our patients of hypertension. With either an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, the initial fall in plasma aldosterone may be followed over weeks by return of plasma aldosterone concentration to baseline or even above. Patients with aldosterone breakthrough seem to have worse outcomes than patients who do not demonstrate the aldosterone breakthrough phenomena while on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. The addition of mineralocorticoid antagonist may block the effect of aldosterone breakthrough and thus potentially improve the clinical outcomes. These are all the studies which have shown that the incidence of aldosterone breakthrough may vary from 23% to almost 50%. And adding this drug to patients who are getting already ACE inhibitors or ARB may be beneficial theoretically. This is how the aldosterone mechanism acts. Angiotensin 1 is converted, angiotensin, angiotensinogen is converted to angiotensin 1, angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2, which acts on the aldosterone mechanism and thus acts on the sodium retention and potassium excretion as well as the cardiovascular effects. So let's see how this drug can be useful in patients, treating patients with resistant hypertension. We know that the resistant hypertension is defined when the BP remains above goal in spite of concurrent use of three antihypertensive agents of different classes. Out of these, one of the three agents should be a diuretic and all agents should be prescribed at optimal dose amounts. The prevalence in various studies have been shown to be right from 20% to as much as 50%. The characteristic that may be associated with resistant hypertension are old age, higher baseline blood pressure, obesity, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, left ventricular hypertrophy, and the female sex. One must always rule out the secondary causes of hypertension like obstructive sleep apnea, renal parenchymal disease, primary aldosterone, which is, occurs to the extent of 20%, renal artery stenosis, thyroid disorders, and heavy alcohol intake. As you can see in this, the incidence of primary aldosterone has been described 7 to 20% in patients with resistant hypertension. The strong associate of resistant hypertension of HbA1c more than 9, creatinine more than 1.5, BMI more than 30, and the apnea hyperapnea score more than 20, that is obstructive sleep apnea. The causes of inadequate response to therapy, it may be pseudo resistance because the patient is not taking the drug properly, there may be white coat effects or it may be because of the other drugs that the patient is taking and one must always rule out the secondary causes of hypertension in such patients. So the mechanism of resistant hypertension can be increased vascular tones, sodium and water retention, abnormal sympathetic nervous system activity, abnormal ROS activation and endothelial nitric oxide mismatch. Primary aldosterone is an important factor in patients with resistant hypertension, those who are not responding to the first-line drugs. And the prevalence is approximately 20%. In evaluation of patients at Birmingham found that 20% consecutively evaluated patients with resistant hypertension were diagnosed with primary aldosterone based on suppressed renin activity and 24-hour urinary aldosterone excretion. As we know that if the aldosterone levels increase, there's a primary hyperaldosterone, the renin levels will come down. These are the various studies, the Seattle, Birmingham, Oslo, Prague, which has shown the incidence of 17% to 22% in patients of resistant hypertension. So a growing, growing body of evidence suggests that hyperaldosteronism contributes significantly to the development and severity of hypertension as well as resistant to antihypertensive treatment. Our work of resistant hypertension should be to confirm that it is really, really resistant hypertension, then exclude the pseudo resistance, suggest lifestyle modification, screen for the secondary causes, and if the still patient does not respond to the th first three drugs, add the fourth drug, which is most commonly the fourth drug is the milocorticoid inhibitors, which may be aldactone or aplerinone. Let us see what the guidelines recommend. GNC8 recommends that aldosterone receptor antagonists should be added as fourth drug for the treatment of resistant hypertension. NICE guidelines recommend that for treatment of resistant hypertension at step four, aldosterone antagonists should be used. 
US FDA has approved this eplendron for the treatment of heart failure following myocardial infarction, and it is also approved for treatment of hypertension. In Europe, eplendron is licensed only for treatment of patients of heart failure, and still it is not approved for treatment of hypertension. The effects of milnocorticoid blockade can be on the heart, blood vessels, blood pressure, and kidney. On the heart, it prevents interstitial fibrosis, remodeling, reduces left ventricle hypertrophy, reduces sudden cardiac death, and improves myocardial perfusion. On the blood vessel, it improves endothelial function, it attenuates the inflammatory lesions and ischemia, and on blood pressure, it reduces both systolic and diastolic blood pressure. And on kidney, it reduces proteinuria and reduces histo the histological damage. So this is how eplenone acts. It blocks the aldosterone pathway. Its action of aldosterone on milnocorticoid receptors is blocked with the result that the more sodium will be excreted and potassium will be retained. The effects, the beneficial effects, the pharmacodynamic properties of eplenone are seen on the vascular endothelium, the kidneys as well as the cardiovascular system. On the vascular endothelium, it causes, it affects the systolic hypertension, it improves the endothelial dysfunction and vascular compliance. On kidney, it reduces the proteinuria and the cardiovascular system. It has been shown to cause reduction in the LV mass in patients with mild to moderate hypertension and left ventricle hypertrophy. As of now, it is approved for post myocardial infarction patients and hypertension. The half life. The T max is 1.5 hours, by availability is 69%, protein binding is 50%, it is metabolized by the liver and there are no active metabolites, half life is 4 to 6 hours, and less than 5% of dose goes unchanged in the urine and feces. In particular situations like pregnancy, there is no clinical evidence, so it should be used only if it is clearly needed. Nursing mothers use if clearly needed. Pediatric patients, it has not been studied. In geriatric patients, no benefit has been found in patients above the age of 75. In renal insufficiency, it should be used with caution because of its effects on potassium level. And in hepatic insufficiency, the drug has not been evaluated. It's contraindicated if the serum creatinine is more than 2 in males and 1.8 in females, and if the creatinine clearance is less than 50 ml. As an antihypertensive, the drug has been used in this dose of 25 to 400 milligram daily, and it has been compared with placebo. There is no effect on the heart rate. At dose of 100 milligram daily, diastolic blood pressure was reduced by approximately 4 to 8 millimeters, and systolic blood pressure by 8 to 12 millimeters. A plerinone 50 to 200 milligram once daily demonstrated similar antihypertensive activity to enalapril 10 to 40 milligram once daily in patients with mild to moderate hypertension. Similar efficacy with amlodipine, similar efficacy as amlodipine 2.5 to 10 milligram once daily in patients with systolic hypertension. A plenarinone 50 to 200 milligram once daily showed good efficiency as losartan 50 to 100 milligram once daily in patients with low renin hypertension. It's better tolerated than spironolactone because it acts specifically against the milocorticoid and doesn't have effect on the testosterone and the progesterone, etc. So it has got less effect on the impotence, doesn't cause less of gynecomastia, menstrual irregularities, female breast pain, hyperkalemia is slightly less with this drug than with the spironolactone. So it has been demonstrated equally efficacious as an antihypertensive drug compared with monotherapy of calcium channel blockers, ACE inhibitors, or ARBs. It exhibits greater efficacy than ACE inhibitor. It may provide protective effect against end organ damage in kidney. A 200 milligram once daily dose also reduces left ventricle mass and reduces LVH. It is administered over 50 to 200 milligram daily and it reduces microalbuminuria. Aplinorone is generally bent tolerated in hypertensive patients. I will not go into the individual studies which has shown. I will just go to the summary slide. And the salient feature of aplinorone are that it is a selective aldosterone blocker approved for the treatment of essential hypertension. Aplinorone reduces blood pressure effectively in patients with essential hypertension, both as monotherapy and in combination with other agents. It exhibits higher degree of selectivity for aldosterone receptors. It has got low binding affinity for progesterone and androgen receptor blockers. 
It has got a favorable tolerability profile. It has got lesser adverse effects, and it's effective and well tolerated when used with ERBs and other diuretics. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Well, that's a that's an excellent talk. Sir. Thank you. Uh, there are two uh, things I'd uh, like to add to this. Uh, one is I'd like to reiterate that. Uh, uh, at the present time, it is absolutely mandatory that we use aldosterone antagonists as the fourth line drug. Uh, in fact, I was chairing a session the day before yesterday, the European Society of Cardiology meeting just got over. And there a paper was presented in which it was seen that if you use aldosterone antagonists as the fourth line drug, then the number of resistant hypertensives falls down to just 15% of what uh, otherwise people would be classified as. So it's a very, very important drug to add as a fourth line drug after you've used an ACE on a RAB plus a CCB plus a diuretic and the diuretic should be chlorothalidon and preferably not hydrochlorothiazide. On the <coughs> secondly, uh, uh, we all know that uh, the renal denervation trial, the Simplicity 3 failed. And uh, one of the important groups that they found was that if they took out the patients who had hyperaldosteronism and their aldosteronism had been treated, then they would have made a better choice. So it also helps us to identify people who would perhaps better respond to therapies like renal denervation. So uh, 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 because, uh, as it was said, a lot of us over here are, uh, uh, you know, physicians. Uh, it is very, man very important to use aldosterone antagonists, uh, at least as their fourth-line drug in management of hypertension. Okay. Uh, with the permission of the moderator, we'll move on to the next presentation, if you could kindly permit. Yeah. You need to put it on. Can we have the microphone of the yeah. chairperson? Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. The question, so that was a great nice presentation. I am Dr. Sidhu from Ludhiana. Uh, sir has already answered because my very question was, what would be your choice where you have recommended it as a monotherapy? What would be the kind of patients if you have to select it as a monotherapy? You see, as of now, the drug is not recommended not as a monotherapy. Yeah, it, because you mentioned actually. No, it is same. If it has got same efficacious as other drugs, but okay. it is not recommended as a monotherapy. Not recommended. The drug as of date is recommended only if the patient has been diagnosed as resistant hypertension when the first three drugs in the first line drugs have not been able to control the blood pressure. Yeah, only then this drug needs to be added. Answered because yeah. since yeah. the line was there, yeah. that was my concern. If you have a patient of renal artery stenosis and renovascular hypertension, do you think it would be a primary drug to start with? I think if a renal artery stenosis, then one has to first remove the blockage. Because as of now, the indications for renal artery stenting, even in renal renovascular hypertension, is very controversial. Yeah. Is, 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 is this drug should be the first choice before renal artery no, stenting? No, I don't think that will be the first choice in those patients because the renal level will be usually higher in these patients, and I don't think that will be the first choice. Okay. So my, my question was, if anybody is already on ACE and ARP, and if he's a diabetic, would you consider starting this medication ahead of calcium channel blockers or beta blockers in case of diabetes to prevent proteinuria? Uh, not as of now. The evidence is not much. The trials that I've seen are usually in very small number of patients, say 67 patients, 117 patients. I think the largest trial that I saw was 165 patients. And all these trials have shown beneficial effects. And I think if we have to recommend it to the extent of guidelines, probably a larger double blind trial needs to be done, but the drug seems to be promising and needs to be studied in such group of patients. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Harshwa.